Good morning. Welcome to this meeting. My name is uh, Juan Carlos de Martin. I'm a professor of uh, computer engineering at the Polytechnic of Turin, from where I speak, and uh, where in 2006, with law professor Marco Ricolfe, co founded the Nexus Center for Internet and Society. I'm also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Today, it is my great pleasure to introduce an extraordinary researcher and intellectual, Professor Kate Crawford. We're going to have a conversation uh, that will last up until approximately uh, 30 minutes from now. We are going also to have uh, some time, about five minutes at the end, uh, to answer questions from the audience. Uh, allow me to introduce Professor Crawford. Professor Crawford, in uh, 2017, with Meredith Whitaker, co-founded the Research Institute AI Now as one of the first organizations dedicated to studying the social implications of the technologies that we broadly label as artificial intelligence. She's also now a research professor at USC Annenberg in Los Angeles and inaugural visiting chair in AI and justice at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, as well as senior principal researcher at Microsoft Research, and more precisely at the Faith, Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Ethics in AI group. Uh, Professor Crawford, very recently, just a few months ago, after five years of work, published a book with Yale University Press uh, titled Atlas of AI, and the subtitle is Power, Politics, and the Planetary Cost of Artificial Intelligence. And just, uh, I like books, allow me to say a few words, 300 pages with notes, uh, six chapters uh, with an introduction and conclusion and a coda. And the book has been attracting a lot of interest, uh, many reviews, and rightly so. I think it's an important book. And therefore, let's start with the book, if I may. So, Professor Crawford, welcome. And tell us a little about why you wrote this book. Why do we need an atlas of AI? Why an atlas? And how do we map artificial intelligence? Well, thank you so much, Juan Carlos. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's, it's fantastic to be here for this conference. In terms of um, Atlas of AI, the, the genesis of this book really has come about from my work in the social implications of artificial intelligence. I've been studying this for almost 20 years. And one of the things that was very clear to me is that we still understand AI as being very much uh, immaterial uh, technology as mathematics and computation in the cloud, if you will. And it's actually a profoundly material technology that has enormous environmental impacts, uses vast amounts of human labor right throughout the supply chain, and of course, depends on vast amounts of data. So what I wanted to do in this project really is to create an atlas of artificial intelligence to see its impacts across the planet. Of course, atlases are, are unusual books. They allow us to look at things at different scales. You can look at the size of an entire continent, or you can zoom in to a city or a mountain range. And I think we need something quite similar in dealing with the different scales of artificial intelligence. Obviously, billions of us are carrying around smartphones and are using search engines. And if we look at these infrastructures that we rely on every day, they're controlled by just a handful of companies, the, the so-called great houses of AI. And so we have a situation now of extreme asymmetries of power in terms of who actually decides how AI works and who it should serve and who benefits, but also who is harmed. So in creating an atlas, I was very interested in, in also thinking about the ways in which atlases show us sort of the lines of empire. They show us how you know the, the most powerful nations have actually divided and conquered. And this too, I think, is happening in the spaces of artificial intelligence. So in that sense, you know, this is really going to a far more topological and environmental set of metaphors for trying to understand these wider implications of artificial intelligence. And as a researcher, I really wanted to be able to answer the question, how is AI made in the fullest sense? Uh, and certainly that's what the book tries to do. Thank you. Yes, and indeed, in your uh, your book, uh, you actually visit places. So 
geographical places where AI or maybe we would just say digital technologies, broadly speaking, are made in the fullest sense. And in fact, you start the journey to a lithium mine in Nevada, uh, mm. where you can see uh, AI as an extractive in the physical sense, not only metaphorical sense. And uh, so what about, can you t what can you tell us about the wider environmental footprint of AI or more, more broadly of digital technologies? It's a topic that mm. is gaining some traction, but I think it's truly important to understand the, the consequences on the environment and the planet. You're exactly right. And it's remarkable how little has actually been written about the impacts of planetary scale computation. Uh, it's to me, it was very important to to go and see these places directly, rather than you know the way that quite often as academics and researchers we you know see things at arm's length, or we might you know read articles. For this project to really bring AI down to earth, I had to actually go to these locations. So, for example, I start the book by visiting the last functioning lithium mine in the United States, and of course, lithium might sound like a very prosaic mineral, but of course it's essential for something that we rely on every day, which is reusable batteries. And of course we have lithium in our iPhones, we have a few grams there, but in a, say in a Tesla car, you have many kilograms, up to around 60 kilograms required to build their battery packs. So this mineral has become incredibly important for how AI at scale can work. It's called grey gold, and of course it's part of the new gold rush in terms of how we create these systems. But it also, of course, is now part of an enormous geopolitical struggle. The Biden administration, in its first few months of office, released an executive order saying that it was important for the US to secure its supply chain against China in particular. And so now you're seeing this rush to try and acquire and store vast amounts of everything from cobalt, lithium, rare earth, which are essential to driving computation at scale. So I think it's really important that we start to look at the mineralogical layer, but also that we look at the amount of energy that is required to drive AI, which is extremely energy intensive, and also the implications on everything from water, which we use at scale in data centers, through to all of the other types of environmental footprints that are left by these types of technologies. In fact, if we look at data centers alone, they overtook the airline industry in terms of its carbon footprint before the pandemic. Of course, given how little most of us have been flying during the pandemic, uh, data centers have considerably overtaken it. So now we're realizing that in fact, large scale computation and AI in particular is extremely resource intensive. Yes, and uh, we just addressed the topic of environment, uh, energy, environment, uh, rare materials, lithium, etc. Another fundamental topic of your book uh, and your research more generally is labor. And again, it's a it's a global issue because you you show um, how widespread is the network of, of people uh, that contribute to AI, and then they are affected by AI in turn. So you have where people labeling uh, data sets for you know very little money in many countries, and where people that are their physical work is actually controlled by quote unquote AI. So I think that's uh, an, an important topic to um, to think about because the obvious uh, also political implications of uh, the role of labor. And, uh, and again, by shedding some light uh, on this specific uh, important aspect of AI, maybe we're also able to learn something about the broader role of labor also in other industries. But let's focus mm -hmm. on AI. So maybe you want to say a few words about this. Well, absolutely. I mean, of course, part of the, the great myth of artificial intelligence is that it is, you know, both artificial and intelligent. In fact, it's neither. We can see by tracking all of these sort of material impacts that it is certainly the opposite of artificial. It's sort of made from the very earth on which we stand, but neither is it intelligent in an autonomous sense. Um, because in fact, we have humans behind these systems all the time, making them function. And, and, and sometimes, as you say, it's crowd workers who are often paid just, you know, a few cents an hour to do a series of, of repetitive tasks to label the data 
data that is used to train AI systems to see the world. But sometimes it's, you know, other forms of labor as well. One of the things I did for researching this book was I spent time inside an Amazon fulfillment warehouse to see what it's like to work in the spaces where humans and robots and algorithmic systems interact, these so-called hybrid workplaces. And, you know, I've, like so many of us, had read many stories about the harsh conditions inside Amazon fulfillment centers. But it wasn't until going there myself that I saw just how shocking it was, where you could see the physical strain uh, for people. They were wearing support bandages, and you saw people with injuries uh, still trying to sort of shift boxes and, and items around the warehouse. But you also saw the psychological stress of people who have screens with algorithms that are tracking if they're meeting the picking rate, and that's the rate by which you are sorting the right amount of objects into trays that then can be shipped to people's homes. So you're seeing a very particular amalgam of really kind of tailorist philosophies in terms of how labor is managed in factories. But it isn't just a question of factory work. I think in many ways, Amazon is a symbol of what is happening much more broadly to workplaces around the world, both in so-called blue collar spaces as well as white collar offices, which is that more and more we're seeing this, this mix of algorithmic management of algorithms that track, you know, how productive you are, how many emails you send, how many meetings you take, you know, are you sort of meeting the same sales target as your, uh, as your colleagues? Um, these are tools and systems that have only increased during the pandemic because, of course, with so many of us working at home like this on video, um, there are so many ways in which employers are now trying to track the productivity of their employees. And this, too, I think increases the power asymmetry between workers and employers. And we see this again being a very core issue in AI, that these are the systems that are used to increase surveillance and algorithmic management. Let's take um, a step back. This new book is actually connected to an earlier work um, of yours, uh, mapping the supply chains of consumer AI devices. Uh, in the book, you talk about the Amazon Echo. Uh, for example, your project with Vladan Joller, Anatomy of an AI System, uh, which I think it's appropriate to remind us, the, our audience, that uh, you got an honorary award from the Starts Prize 2019, and now is on the permanent collection of MoMA. So what's the connection between this earlier work and the book? It's so interesting, uh, the project Anatomy of an AI System <clears throat> was transformative for me. It, it really was the, the project that changed the way I see AI. Um, you know, having been a, an academic and a professor for so long, I'd sort of studied so many of these questions from a legal and a sociological perspective and from technical perspectives. But I'd never tried to trace all of the supply chains to make a single AI system. So Vladan and I were really interested in all the ways you need to actually make a single Amazon Echo. These are the units that you might have sitting on your kitchen bench or in your bedroom, depending how you feel about listening devices. Um, and we were trying to understand the data pipelines, first of all, in terms of voice-enabled AI. And we could map that. But then we thought, what about the components inside the cylinder? Where do they come from? Who produces them? And so then we had to go all the way back to the mines to see where they were being mined, where they were being smelted, how they, how they were being produced, and then the shipping lines in terms of where they're transported around the world. And then we traced all the way to the end of life of these devices to see where they're thrown out into e-waste tips in places like Ghana and Pakistan. And in doing this, we saw, if you will, the sort of nose to tail production process of a single AI device. And in doing this, it was clear to me that we, it, it gave me a completely different understanding of what it costs to have this little convenience of being able to say to Alexa, Alexa, what's the weather today? Or, you know, Alexa, order me some detergent. Um, and you're invoking this enormous planetary network into being. And so from doing that project, it was clear that I needed to move from looking at just a single device to looking at the entire AI industry. And uh, listening to you and uh, reading the book, um, it reminds me that um, uh, your approach, the approach you just described, uh, reminds me a lot uh, uh, the way Jacques Ellul or Neil Postman thought uh, about technology. 
specifically Jacques Ellul uh, in his mm -hmm. famous, you know, 75 questions to ask about any technology, he precisely asked uh, to think, uh, to force us to think about where this technology comes from, where it ends up when it's broken or when it's obsolete. And, uh, and I think it's a very powerful way of thinking, not only specifically about AI, but broadly about technology. You know, it could be this, this pen, it could be anything that all the artifacts that surround us uh, that yes. uh, maybe are, are less obscure, less, less uh, interesting than uh, artificial intelligence, but yet are, may have a profound environmental or, or labor or, or cultural impact. Precisely. Um, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned Jacques Ellul, who's been uh, such an influence on me and on, on so many thinkers. Um, I think also here of Langdon Winner, who, you know, once wrote that artifacts have politics, everything, you know, from a pen mm -hmm. to a bridge to a mobile phone. Um, and, and part of this project is to say artifacts also have political economies. And so how do we look at the broader political economies of big tech? And, you know, as you say, you know, some of this is is about AI, but some of it is is just more broadly about what essentially digital computation looks like today in this late stage of capitalism. And so part of what I do in the book is to try and look at what is just the nature of building large scale compute. And then how does AI specifically change things? What is it about the way in which we have outsourced some of our key decision making in places like healthcare, education, criminal justice, to these systems that we are told are objective and neutral. Whereas, as you know, as well as I do, when you start looking at the training data and the systems by which these, these AI agents are built, it is the furthest thing from objectivity and neutrality that you can imagine. So I think it's important to understand both where we're simply just talking about digital technology generally, and where there are sort of specific ways of seeing that machine learning in particular is bringing into our social institutions. Absolutely. And also it's a very important uh, lesson for, I'm a computer engineer, so for the way we train computer engineers and we have, I have I'm, you know, proud to say that at the Polytechnic here, we have started to introduce some of those topics in the curriculum of uh, computer engineers, because we think that computer engineers, uh, uh, not only as citizens, but also to be better computer engineers, uh, should be at least have a glimpse uh, of the topics that we're discussing today. Um, one of the things that, that I found interesting is that your focus on classification and actually, when I try, you know, to demystify so-called artificial intelligence to, to lay audiences, I try to tell them, well, look, it's mostly classification, which sounds sounds like uh, something neutral or not a big deal, but it's actually, it's a very powerful thing to classify, classify people, classify all sorts of other things. So uh, you make the specific example of uh, classifying emotions. Mm -hmm. Do you want... Can we say something more about why it could be a problem to be classified by AI regarding our emotions? I love the way you've put this because you're exactly right that classification is one of the core things that AI does. And it is profound. AI systems are classifying us every day in terms of ad tech categories around products we might be interested in, classifying us in terms of gender or race. But if you look at the ways in which these classifications are made, they're quite often you know, horrifically retrograde in the way that they're designed. For example, systems that will classify you into binary gender, even though that is profoundly out of date in, in this new year of 2021, or use you know, deeply disturbing and sort of colonial ideas around sort of four racial groups that people are being mapped into. But the one which I dedicate a whole chapter to in the book is around what's called emotion recognition AI. These are systems that are already being used right now, uh, often in hiring. So if this was a job interview and I was interviewing you, Giancarlo, and I'd be like asking you questions and saying, so, you know, what makes you think you're right for this job? And then I would be able to analyze the video and to look at the micro expressions in your face. And what these systems claim to do is to by mapping micro expressions to predict what your internal state is, your internal emotional state, and to make predictions about whether you'd be a good employee. Now, by tracing the intellectual history of this idea, I found just extraordinary that there was one man, Paul Ekman, who pursued this concept that there were six universal emotions. Now, this was despite the fact that 
many people, famous anthropologists like Margaret Mead had said, this is a ridiculous idea, context sociality, culture have so much impact on, you know, how we express ourselves and and you simply cannot make this one-to-one relationship between, you know, somebody smiling and assuming they're happy. I mean, any of us who've worked in a cafe or a bookshop can tell you that that's not the case. But yet there are these systems that claim that they can do this almost sort of polygraph of emotion. And by truly tracing the, the scientific ideas and finding that they're based on extremely contentious claims. They've nonetheless been encoded into machine learning systems. So we have very unscientific ideas, or at the very least, highly questionable ideas that are being sold to us as though they are neutral and objective ways of assessing people's worth as employees or in the criminal justice system or as many of these systems are now being sold into remote education during a pandemic. They simply don't work. And this is another case of where many AI systems are simply just selling a form of snake oil. So I think it's incredibly important that we have much greater skepticism around what AI can do. And we empower people to actually say, we don't want this system in our school, or we don't want to use this as part of our hiring process. And to give people the ability to know when these systems are being used and the ability to refuse them when they wish to. Yes, the, this culture of refusal that you that you mentioned, I think it's, it's truly important because, you know, I'm an engineer, I speak from a polytechnic, and so it's, it's almost blasphemy to think that uh, technology can be refused. Um, <laughs> but it's actually, we, we need a, a very lay approach to technology. Technology is something that is produced by human beings, um, typically for profit, but it's produced by human beings. And uh, it, Definitely, we should think of technology democratically, just like any other topic. And we should, the first question should be, do we want this technology? Yes. So the, the if, then we can talk about the how, the when, and the shape, uh, and everything else. But the first question should be, do we want it? And to do that uh, is not being a luddist, even though being a luddist uh, could be actually a compliment, not necessarily an insult, like many people think it is, uh, in the sure. sense that uh, we need to think that technology about the consequences of technology. And in some cases, and specifically in the case of AI, we have that. In some cases, the right action is to refuse the technology to cool. Mm-hmm. So we're thinking, talking about facial recognition or emotional recognition, we should really say maybe the real way forward is just not use the technology in the first place. Precisely. Yeah, so it's it's difficult to do because we have to, uh, you know, unbuild uh, this, this presumption that technology is by definition progress. Uh, and it's not, unfortunately. I wish it was, but it, unfortunately it is not. It is not. And, and, and I think what you're pointing to is, is something that I think is a very profound issue that we are currently facing, which is this idea of technological inevitability, that once it can be built, it should be and will be deployed. And against that, I think we do need to develop a stronger politics of refusal, the ability to say, what impact will this technology have on civil society more broadly? If we look at the impact of, say, facial recognition, the way in which it can profoundly chill people's ability to protest, to engage in their communities, to feel as though they have the ability to participate without constantly being tracked and observed, that is a corrosive concept to democracy. And yet it's being already sold into, you know, so many parts of everyday life. So not only do we need a politics of refusal, but I think there's a real urgency here. We actually need to find more coalitions to find practices of refusal and soon. Yes, allow me to remind the the audience of a scholar that passed away four years ago, Stefano Rodotà was a legal scholar and public intellectual in Italy. And in 1997, so so many years ago now, uh, he said as, um, as president of the privacy authority in Italy, he said, um, mm-hmm. uh, the mere fact, I'm just quoting by memory, the mere fact that a technology is feasible doesn't mean that it should be deployed. We should think about whether it's legally permissible, culturally acceptable, politically, um, you know, accept, democratically accepted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's the, the right approach. And it was really, it, it would see I had of the time because it was 
you know, 25 years ago, 24 years ago. Okay, I think it's time to look at the questions coming from the audience. I see the first one on my panel. Um, how can we use AI to improve our democratic system? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I, I love putting this question in context with that wonderful quote that you just raised, Juan Carlos, which is that, you know, why do we assume that AI is going to be the important actor in improving democracy? Perhaps, in fact, keeping AI at arm's length in certain spaces will actually improve democratic processes. We can certainly see this in terms of the way in which AI systems, say, back-ended in things like uh, Facebook, for example, have been part of manipulating uh, political elections around the world. So I think in many ways we have a tendency to center technology too much, uh, to assume that AI will be the solution to our problems rather than asking the more broad question, how do we improve our democratic system? And then perhaps AI is part of that, but but most likely not. Most likely we have to think more broadly at the context in which we live. Uh, how do we improve democracies in a time of climate change, growing pandemics and, and political mistrust? Um, these are the questions that I think are far more important. So I, I tend to think we need to decenter technology as being the central actor. Yes, it's going to take some time because we spent maybe the past 20 years putting technology at the center of everything, the solution for everything. So we need to yes. slowly and, and patiently unbuild uh, that uh, the kind of approach to technology. Um, I don't see a question, but I have a, a comment uh, uh, still regarding the book. You end the book with a discussion about the modern day space race between Bezos, Bezos and Musk, Elon Musk. Uh, why? What can we learn about the, how the future <laughs> is being managed when the tech billionaires all want to leave the planet, apparently. Why did you choose <laughs> <Apparently>. this specific? <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Apparently, when you make all the money and you become the richest man on the planet, the first thing you want to do is leave. Um, so I think that should certainly raise a few warning flags for the rest of us. I mean, you know, part of the the purpose of doing this work is to see the ways in which artificial intelligence has become the extractive industry of the 21st century, much in the way that mining was the emerging extractive industry of the 17th and 18th centuries. And here too, we can think about the way in which we've seen this private space race focus now on extraction from space. It's about, it's, it's about space mining in great parts. Um, and it, it, to me, points to the ideology that underlines so many of these systems. It's about continuing growth at all costs, rather than focusing on the fact that we live on a planet that is facing a climate crisis and we have a responsibility to each other and to this planet that we know that we can inhabit, rather than seeking to abandon it only for, of course, the very wealthy. So I think, you know, to me that shows in many ways that the deeply undemocratic and I think sort of, again, profoundly concentrated forms of power that are circulating in big tech. And we're now seeing that transpire as this space race between a handful of the richest tech billionaires on the planet. Uh, it's a wonderful conversation and I wish we could go on for a much longer time, but uh, I see that the time is, uh, is uh, almost up and um, it's a true a pity. I hope there will be another chance to continue this conversation. In the meantime, I invite the audience to, to read the book. I'm, I'm told that it's going to appear in Italian at some point in the future, so I hope uh, that also will definitely facilitate the conversation in, in my country. Uh, before thanking Professor Crawford, allow me to remind the audience that this afternoon at, at 3.30, there will be a session touching on some of these topics. It is a session on, on ethics in which curators uh, Jose Luis de Vicente and Ghislaine Boddington will explore some of the ethical aspects of technology and AI, leading to a critical conversation on the controversies behind its development. I don't miss it. And uh, having said that, many thanks uh, to Professor Crawford for your time and your contribution. Look forward to meeting you again. It's such a pleasure. And hopefully next time we will be doing this all in person. Here's I hope that. so. I hope so. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye now. Bye-bye.